I kind of came into here confident, but nonetheless a little apprehensive of the fact that it was going to be going out so fast. Not an 850 shape by any stretch of the imagination. But I thought I'd be closer to like 910, 915. Um, but as I was walking in here and even coming into the race, I think the repetitive concern that I was raising to both my coaches and my boyfriend, softening my sounding board for all my worries, is the fact that although my fitness is progressing, um, we've been focusing a lot on very aerobic work because the last injury that I've had was an Achilles um, problem and it didn't really heal up until honestly around the time I dropped the New York Times story. So it's only been a couple months in which I've been able to do faster stuff. Um, and it's fun because like, you know, I can randomly pull out a 229 again, but everything else has been very like a mile repeat sort of workout. So going through those first eight laps, I was like, just hang in the back, try to feel as comfortable as you can. And truthfully, that 450 felt comfortable, but I think it's sort of like when I run a 229. It feels really good, but as soon as I'm supposed to do a 300 and extend it, oh my god, I'm 220 <laughs> in and I'm on the floor. So <laughs> I think um, it's really difficult. I know anybody I've spoken to have gone through a similar thing to race when you're not super sharp. And for somebody like me, I have this really positive backstory of knowing how to run fast. But at the same time, that's very bad because going into a race, I'm like, oh no, I haven't run 450 in a workout yet and I have to go through in that. So long story short, I'm disappointed by the 9.4. I'm sure, you know, I'll cry to my dog later. Not literally, I'm joking. <laughs> But at the same time, I'm just trying to take it as positive I can because outgroups what matters and two months of building just hasn't been enough to really race sharp. But the reason I'm out here is because outdoors are really important here for me and when you haven't raced in a long time, you kind of deserve to get your ass kicked in indoors so that you can run while in outdoor. And so now whenever it comes to, I feel like, because you've obviously had the longest background in running possible, like for so many years over the stretch of so many years, yeah. whenever you come off of an injury or come back into running, how do you make sure that you're not comparing yourself to old times and you're not comparing yourself to the level that you may have been at before an injury? Because I know that's so mentally tough to totally. be able to do that. So the reason that I did not race for three to four years is because I was really bad at that. The so, mental aspect, right? Yes. Every single time I'd come out of an injury, I'd be like, okay, I off the job for four hours a day. Yeah, that was me, eye twitching. And within two months, I'd be trying to run workouts that were you know, nine minute 3K shape. But truthfully, that doesn't make sense for your progression. I'm personally an athlete who I feel if I ran 30 miles a week, I would always be able to run about 410. But I would never get faster than that. Ever. That's what I looked like in freshman year and sophomore year of high school. I ran really fast, but God, I was never going to run a 4 minute, 1500 based on that training. Right now, I'm an athlete who's, I still am going to have a, I think like 76 mile week this week, because I'm just, I'm in it for outdoor. And I'm going to tell you those last four laps were really hard, not just physically, but mentally. I was like, I am so far behind. And I kind of have to suck it up though. And not let my own ego get ahead of me because I see the day-to-day -day training, I see the progression, and unfortunately two weeks of better work did not show in a race. But this was a really different race than last time and maybe had I even split it like the last one, I would have been more like 918 and you know, the tortoise and the hare story always kind of annoyed me because the tortoise always wins, but <laughs> it's just, there's truth for it. Uh, just taking you to the, the starting line today, you heard that roar from the crowd when they announced your name. What does it mean to you to hear how excited people are just to see you run? It really, really means a lot to me, and I think what I always have to remind myself is that I'm in a field today of, I think there were 16 women on the line. There are so many more people who are running than just 16. And there are so many people, elites and sub-elites alike, just recreational athletes who understand that you know, sometimes you run your best marathon ever, you have a year where you're not running as well, and the climb back can really take a while. And I think there are so many people that sympathize with that struggle that 
sometimes it's that knowledge that kind of brings me back to earth. I usually take a few hours to be a little sad, and then I have to pick myself and say, like, I got an hour 40 long. Like, this is not really what my year's about. My year's about now getting that chair. <laughs> also, I have to say, it was great. Downstairs in the warm-up area, at first, me and Caitlin were the only two runners in the field who did not try to run outside. And I was like, New York! And then we were like, kind of in the back. I was like, oh. <laughs> And now, oh, we said, come on. Did you say anything to her after the race? Did you never yeah, I did. I did. Um, you know, first thing I said was, I was like, Sorry, I didn't say anything to you as I was going by. Because usually, you know, if I'm in that situation, particularly if I'm in the back of a field, I like to like a job to get up. And I was like, oh, I was too tired. I was just trying to finish. But um, I actually gave her my number um, because, you know, I know how challenging it is to be in the spotlight. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is the last thing I want to be doing after running a 9 freaking 24 3K. Like, that is not the athlete that I think I am. That is not the athlete I want to be. But at the same time, I have been doing this for a very long time. And I know she's still kind of new in the sport. And I always just want to pass on any wisdom that I can from a younger athlete. Because at the end of the day, I, I, I sympathize probably like very few people do. And I always want her to really carry herself with confidence, with noise, no matter how she's feeling. And she's honestly doing great. She, she looked really good over there. I think she's disappointed like anybody would be. but. She was already taking off her spikes, probably going to go cool down, so she's good. You think she'll call you? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I think she, I think she will. Um, you know, truthfully, um, I think what I have learned in this sport is that it's very easy to feel very alone. Um, we're individual athletes in individual sport, and of course there are programs that train together, but even within that, it's like every group is kind of separate. And today was the first meet I have ever gone to, and I really felt such a camaraderie amongst all the women in the field. Um, and I think it helps when you're the person who's on the upswing and when you're a younger athlete and all those things. But I think that our sport is kind of in the middle of changing of the guard. And I think the new guard that's stepping up is really great during the season. Yeah, because I was going to say, I feel like over all the years, even like from whenever I was in high school, it's it, like the team aspect amongst everybody, not even just anybody on your team, has really grown. And I feel like whenever you see these younger athletes coming up, I mean, a thing over here was just saying that you even spoke with her yeah. too, and that like you reached out to her and you were like, here, like, if you ever need to talk to me, talk to me. Do you feel not an obligation to reach out, but to make sure that they know that they're not alone, that you went through the same thing, yeah. even though you are a little older than them now? like. Sure. Um, I absolutely do. Um, I'm going to tell a really honest story, and I'm going to try not to get emotional as I tell it. Um, but after my own experience as a young pro, or at least a young person who was on you know, the pro scene, um, there is one life regret that I have with everything that I went through. And that was that there was one um, younger athlete who uh, joined the Oregon Project after I did. Um, she was a girl from Japan. and. We could go into a whole spiel about it, but she joined the year that I moved home to New York um, to like try to get over my eating disorder, and I never said anything to her. I never warned her. Um, I never even admitted to her what I was currently going through. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was because selfishly I was still trying to stay on the team. And even though I knew that it was um, put a bluntly and dangerous environment for a young athlete that I was in, um, I think I was in such self-denial that I, I, I let her join that team. And um, that's really one of my biggest regrets because she went through something very similar to I did, um, and. We continued talking kind of after she left the team. Um, I reached out to her a bunch of times on Instagram. Her Instagram uh, isn't up anymore. I haven't heard from her in a while. Um, ever since my story came out, I've been kind of looking for her. Because I just wanted to say I'm sorry. Um, and for me, um, my biggest thing is I don't want there to be another Nozomi. And if I can stop that, 
um, I won't be a coward anymore. And even if I don't know the athlete, even if I don't know the program that they're on, um, I will always be there as an advocate for you. And so I think it's the least I can do to, you know, really be a sounding board whenever I can. Um, because I can't ever forgive myself for not being brave in the past. And I'm, from here on out, never going to do that again. I think that I can speak for everybody whenever we say that. Thank you for all your honesty over all the years, too, and especially these last few months. You've been really open, even in those moments during high school or during like your uh, pro time, whenever you felt like you couldn't say anything. You can't take that back, like you said, but you're making up for it right now, and that's all you can do right now moving forward. So I think that you just need to take this with you and then just try to appreciate the voice that you have now. Thank you, and I think... Um, you know, the the coward of the past, the cowardly Gary, never would be racing right now. Because if there was even a thought in my mind that I wasn't in it to win it, honestly, I probably would have dropped out of that race eight laps in. Because I think as athletes, we hold ourselves to this strange level of ego where it's all about you. Um, and don't get me wrong. I wanted to win that race, but I, I also knew in my mind that I'm at a different phase than other people. My progress is going to be different, um, and my story is going to be different than anybody else's. And I think the really great thing about today was lining up on that line. Um, you know, there are other women like Nikki who are doing amazing things for this sport outside of athletics. And I think it's that ability to transcend the sport um, that is why this next group of people are so both intriguing and easy to cheer for, even as a competitor. Nikki, how did you change the city of race in a couple years? Did you unless it was all married in one race, but yeah. this year you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. How did you make that change? Um, well, for the last few years, it was more I couldn't race. Um, the two races that I dropped out of, I hurt myself mid-race. Um, and so I just had a lot of injuries. But I think at the same time, there was always, like if you were in my camp, almost, there was always some desperation to constantly be back. And um, I think it was because I tied so much of my self-worth, and trust me, if you're a runner, you understand this, to my performance. And it's, that's not to say that right now I'm not like really angry that I just ran a 924. Um, but at the same time, I also know that that is not, it's not even the sheep that I'm in right now. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I can't I must be as emotional about performance. Um, I can be emotional about it for a very short period of time, but in so many ways, it's just kind of taking the ego out of it and following the process. And um, looking at it in that way, I can't be that disappointed with this race just because where I am in the process, I probably went out a little hard. Um, and whenever you go out hard, you're going to die a little harder. And so. We'll see what next time happens. Mary, are you finding the joy in running again after the win? Yeah, about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is surrounding myself with almost a new team. Um, and by that, I don't mean in terms of literal people. I think more in terms of the mindset, where you know I am more invested in all of my training partners and all of my coaches and all of my support staff. And I think as a result, there's this broader camaraderie that I'm developing. Um, and I'm also doing fun things like going for a run with my boyfriend. You know, maybe I would rather run in the morning one day and then I'm like, you know, I could really use some help out there. I'll wait until the evening when he comes home from work and we'll go for a run. Or, um, it's just the weirdest thing, but like, my dog is really fast. She doesn't really know how to like go for a run yet, but she will fly. And I think in the past, I almost would have been so scared to run with her because I'd be like, this is extra miles I don't need, or like, I'm going to hurt myself because I'm running in Tom's. Okay, maybe that is true. <laughs> but I still just, you know, let loose with her. And I, and I kind of, in that moment, I'm like, this is really fun. This is why I run. You know, and that's why she runs. And also to try to catch mummy some dinner, a.k.a. squirrels, which she's not caught yet, very luckily. 
kind of naughty song? She's um like a setter mix. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go talk a little bit about Nala. Let's hear it. Um, we got her like around this time last year. Her dog anniversary is February 2nd. I expect lots of presents, everybody. <laughs> um, when we adopted her through um, an organization in the city called Money Cause, um, so we were told she was six. So we're gonna call her seven on February 2nd. And yes, if my social media is going up with Nala, that's 90% of what I post anyway, so I'm, I'm sorry. No need to be sorry. <gasps> oh, well, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like local people. Um, so the Henwood Hounds is a long group, group I train with. We meet up in Social Park every Sunday. I'll be out there with them tomorrow. Um, it's a lot of like some elite marathoners who can probably run between like 235, 250. So they're good like long run buddies. Um, Cause that's their workout for the week. And for me, I'm like trying to not push it too hard. Um, and then recently, um, the girl who actually beat me in the 3K uh, the other day, I'm going to start trying to hop in to runs with. And there's a great Ethiopian community in the Bronx that I might try to meet up with. Um, and there's like a few things I'm trying to do because honestly, all of my workouts have been, have been alone. And um, that's great for the phase that I'm in. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, if I count November as when I started running, this is almost like an pro mindset. This kind of is my November. Um, so I'm a little bit behind, but at the same time, like this is kind of that phase where I want to start running with more people. No, in a lot of ways, I wanted to see how this goes, and I think we're gonna have to regroup, um, talk about some things. Um, again, I think fitness-wise, I'm in better shape than I just ran, so it's a little bit frustrating. Um, but just gotta kind of keep moving and see what's next. Two weeks ago, you ran faster than you did two weeks ago, and you went out a lot harder. Yeah, see, that's the You're thing. You're definitely a lot better shape, but yeah. also at the same time, I would say, like you said, I, I knew you couldn't run for 910, so kind of a little bit worse than you wanted, not that much. Really, right? That's the thing. It's like, I, in a lot of ways right now, I'm in that phase where, even being downstairs, I was like, oh my god, I haven't done this in four years, meaning kind of be with like a pro group. And I think there's something about that where, it's different running with kind of sub elite guys and just, you know, zoning out, being dragged along, running even paced, and kind of going for it and then struggling a bit. Um, this was a faster field than I think I even expected. Um, you know, and I think everybody went out a little bit harder, but, you know. It's pro racing. It's pro racing, June's what matters, you know, next time. Oh, Mary, you're talking about the spring. Yeah. What are your goals this spring and what do you have lined up to run? So I don't have anything lined up in terms of races. <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying to go with the flow. Um, I've only been really doing workouts for about like eight weeks at this point. Okay. Um, and by that I mean like um, kind of like longer endurancey stuff. Um, and so right now I'm kind of in that phase where it's just every week I'm trying to get a little bit better. I'm not tapering at all during indoor. I'm more just trying to hop into races to like get to a last lap, kind of die, and kind of push through it. Um, and then I hope then that by outdoor, I have that kind of feeling of like, you know, you eat your waffles four hours before and you tie your shoes this way and kind of some of that stuff too. Um, but I should probably go cool down, put some clothes on. Um, yeah, go for it all. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.